Hello, everybody. Welcome to part, I don't know the number, <laughs> of, our, four. Four, of our discussion <laughs> on, on shadow work. I think this is going to be an ongoing series we're going to be investing in for the rest of our lives, because I do want to emphasize this again before we get started on our topics today, um, especially for those that are beginning this journey, it's never ending. As long as you're in a human body, there's going to be uh, something to learn, right? That's just, that's what we signed up for when we incarnated into a body. And so I just want to reiterate that there's no finish line. Like there's no finish line when it comes to this. It, you just go deeper and deeper and deeper into your understanding of yourself. And so if anybody is feeling overwhelmed right now by the idea of embarking on this journey, don't be overwhelmed. Because this is literally just the whole kind of point of being here is, is to go on this journey. And, and, and as painful as it can be, it can be a very beautiful journey, too. And so how are you ladies doing this morning? How do I look? <laughs> I look tired. <laughs> I'm very you tired. look great, actually. Well, I, I have I'm, I'm exhausted. But. Yeah. I'm PMSing. I'm just going to say it. I'm PMSing. <laughs> I, I told yeah. the ladies before we started, like, I can't decide whether I'm hot or cold. My uterus can't seem to regulate my body temperature right now because she's throwing a temper tantrum. Um, well, there was a comedian one time that said that we get like PMSy before our period because our uterus is so pissed there's on a baby in there that it like throws a temper tantrum. <laughs> And oh my gosh, work, that's you know, funny. Let's pull that's everything funny. down and like, damn it. <laughs> um, so if you see me get up, it's because I'm either turning the fan off or turning it back on again. I know the ladies out there understand understand that. So I know Steph was like, I never see you in long sleeves. I'm like, it's just been one of those mornings. I can't decide whether I'm hot or cold. I can't decide what's happening. So I'm freezing. It's getting cold here and it's really, really depressing. Yeah, same. So we're about to be hit with a bunch of rain up here in Atlanta coming from uh, Ian down in Florida. Um, I did post an update video yesterday because you guys do. I do have family in that area. I know that um, it's complete devastation. And I'll reiterate today before we get on the topic, if anybody from Florida watches and you've lost everything and you're feeling hopeless, uh, first of all, I validate that. I, I understand it's a very overwhelming place to be. Um, but second of all, just reach out if you need us to, and I think I speak for both Emily and Stephanie, if you need us to promote a GoFundMe, any, any crowdsourcing for you to help you get your business back up. Um, we know the insurance companies are going to be uh, working with you guys, but it's probably going to take a while. So if you need any help from our platforms to help you guys get back on your feet, just let us know. Let us know what we can do to, to help you guys, um, because I, I have seen the footage and holy shit. It's mm -hmm. bad. It's bad. I'd like it's to... Bad. I'd like I'd like to say too that Reiki can help with situations and with outcomes. Um, so if anyone is in dire need of anything like that, let me know. Um, I'd be willing to work with you, especially if finances are an issue right now. Um, so just uh, I'll put my email in the description box and you can reach out if you if you need. That's very kind. I mean, that's very kind. Yeah. I was telling Stephanie on the phone yesterday that um, I saw some drone footage of the beach where right where my family is. And I didn't even recognize it because all the hotels are gone. Just obliterated. All you saw was trash and pools. And that was it. And that's all businesses. I mean, we think about that like that's somebody's business. Mm hmm. That's gone. And even the hotels that are still left standing, they're not able to take people in right now because I know somebody posted on the comment section um, that their family, one of their families was in a hospital and it started to flood out. And that's concerning. Mm -hmm. um, I know my family, half of their roof blew off on one side of the house and they have some trees that went down and their backyard is flooded, but the neighbor's house is destroyed. Um, and so it's is very, and, and I've, I said this on the, on the on the community tab you know my florida family is like floridians for generations they've gone they go, they hunker down they don't they don't run from hurricanes they hunker down and go through them this is the only time i've ever seen them call us to make sure that we knew where all of their paperwork was because they were that that's how bad the storm was they didn't know if they were going to survive and they couldn't once the, once the bridges i mean once, you know, where, where a lot of these, you know, if you're in that Tampa Bay, Sarasota, St. Petersburg area, it's a lot of little islands. Mm -hmm. And so the bridges go up and down. And um, at one point they, they lifted the bridges and you couldn't get off. It was, it, so it's not like you could, uh, you could just decide to turn around and leave. No, you had to stay. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so, and I know a lot of people are saying they can't get in touch with a lot. I know our family, they, we, their phones aren't picking up right now, but we think they just lost charge because we know they're okay. But because the power is gone, um, losing power for that long. And I know DeSantis is doing an incredible job. I saw he had um, the uh, backup people ready to go to help get the communities uh, power back up and running. And I'll explain that too. Like my family can't leave their house right now because so many power lines are down that one law, one wrong step and it could uh, electrocute you. Oh my goodness. So that's the issue people are dealing with too, is the power lines so much is down and in disarray and hidden under debris that they can't even leave their houses right now. It's safer inside of their houses. So um, that's going to be a long haul to get those power lines cleaned up and get that. Cause I, I would imagine that's probably the first step is getting electricity back on for people. Um, I know my family has a generator, but it's still very, very dangerous. And so I don't want to make light of that. We have a lot of our fellow um, community members in this great awakening live in that area. And so we are definitely thinking about you guys. And again, if there is anything that we can do. What's the point in us having a pretty big platforms if we don't use it for good? And I know, yeah. I know I can speak for Emmy and Stephanie because there are two of my friends off of, off of YouTube as well. This we we created our, our platforms for a community because we are all walking each other home. Esoteric Atlanta doesn't belong to just me. It belongs to all of us. So if I can use my platform to help in any way, whether that's promoting a GoFundMe, whatever you guys need, just let me know. Just send me an email and I will do what I can. To help you guys. I almost wonder if we should even just set up a GoFundMe, um, just a generalized one. And if anybody needs help, we can send them something. That's a really good idea. That's we'll talk about that off screen. Yeah, we can talk go. about that off screen and then go from there. I think that we should help to some degree. Yeah, whatever we can do. And we try. I mean, listen, I know, I know, and you know, in the jaded world, you know, we don't know these people. What, honey, I've seen, I've, I've been shown so many because I have family down there. This, this. One of my family members who's Floridian through and through said that they, he doesn't think that this is that they're ever going to really recover from this. So that like area is like a Katrina type thing. Yeah. It's never going to be the same. Like it's never going to fully recover from, from Ian. So, um, yeah, I'm wondering, we, we haven't heard much. My, my husband's stepdad is the maintenance manager at the Don Cesar in St. Petersburg. I don't even know if that hotel is, is one of the ones that's still standing. I have no idea. I don't either. We I know don't... that we know that they're safe, but like you said, we can't we can't contact them. They're not picking up. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm just glad to know. I know a lot of people said their family was safe too, but they have lost contact. I think what's happening, guys, don't panic. I think people are just losing their the charge on their cell phones, and they're not able to charge them right away. I mean, you think, oh, just go to your car and plug it in and charge it up, but you don't know, like. With that situation, any cars are underwater too, yeah. or if the car got moved, you don't know if the car got picked up and moved. Um, if it's able to pull a roof off of a house and tear down a big hotel, it can it can pick a car up. For so, sure. um, so you don't know, and they might not be telling you that right now because because a lot of the people in Florida don't even know the extent of their property damage yet because they can't leave their house right now, so they might not even know that their car is down the street. You know, that's how bad this was. And I know that there are some truthers out there that were making light of this. Like it was fake news. It's not, I'm telling you, it's not fake news. It's not, mm -hmm. this is, this is very serious um, for the people that are there right now. And, um, and I know I was watching someone from Orlando and who's not a truther, but I watch her channel sometimes. And the day before she was talking about how it wasn't that bad, but then Orlando also lost power too, because it started to hit into Orlando as well. And so a lot of Florida is being devastated by this. And so, um, and so just let us know man versus nature, nature always wins. We can never defeat nature. We always just have to learn how to work with nature. And so um, anything you need us to do, I, I, I've watched so many videos too, of people that went out in the storm to rescue animals like that is the world I want to live in. Yeah. We're, we're risking our lives just to rescue a dog too, because that was beautiful to me to see all those. Cause that's the first thing I worry about too, is all the animals. I'm even worried about the sea life because we know Tampa Bay, all the water got sucked out of Tampa Bay. And then it's that was out. crazy. That was yeah. crazy. I've that's seen so it. powerful. It's empty. It's like it's a tsunami empty. is about to approach or something. Yeah. Yeah. Think about all that sea life. Think about it, like all that sea life that's being displaced right now, being sucked up and thrown around, you know, even, even, even though the alligators kind of freak me out when I'm down there because they lurk, 
you know, and like when you're walking your dog in, in Florida, you do have to be aware of alligators because they're everywhere in Florida. You do have to be aware of that. People will put signs up and sometimes we'll put fencing up, but there are so many alligators and you think about even the alligators being thrown around by the weather. I mean, it's, it's bad. And so, um, I'm glad it's over. Like we're, we're about to get the rain up here in Atlanta, but it's just going to be a heavy thunderstorm. It's not going to be anything up here. So I want to bring something up too, real quick. Something I saw this morning, I was so freaking disturbed over it. Uh, people saying, oh, the white hats created this with their own, you know, uh, weather manipulation. And it's to, it's to uncover things and, and clean out things. What kind of psychopath? No, no. Wow. I think logically, you know, this has totally devastated communities. We don't even know the death toll at this point. No. We don't so even know how many people lost their lives. you saying that the white hats are the ones that created that? No, because then they're too psychotic. Yeah. It's this, if anything, it's the black hats that did that. Oh, absolutely. Because direct, of where it was directly hit, that's where military bases are. That's where a lot of the people in the community live. That's where my contacts are, are in Sarasota. Um, we also know that DeSantis is a target because he's basically the MVP right now of what true leadership looks like. Yeah. And so we know he's being targeted before the midterm. So, and you know, and I'm still, I'm still of the belief that sometimes these storms can just be nature. They can just be a, a, an effect of nature. Um, but I definitely, this is not a white hat thing. No, not at all. And shame on you guys for saying that. I, I dare you to say that to the face of someone who just lost everything. I dare you to say that to their face. That's not okay. It's just like saying the white hats were the one who invaded Mar-a-Lago bullshit the white yeah. hats are not psychopaths so if anything if it was human if it was brother manipulation it was done by the, the bad guys not the good ones so but anyway on to our topic at hand once again i will put there i'll put emmy's contact as well let us know what we can do to serve you guys in your time of need right now what's it the the quote from um the ramayana hanuman says when i don't know who i am i serve you when i know who i am i am you mm. That's, that's Hanuman saying, when I don't know who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, I am you. So we're, we are you. We, we are all one. We're all one fractal of the same source consciousness. And we serve each other. And so um, let us know what Emmy, Stephanie, and I can do to serve you guys at this time. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the real fun work the shadow work so you know i'm a really strict teacher when it comes sorry guys i'm gonna blow my nose too not only am i pmsing but i'm getting over a strep throat my nose has been congested forever so it's just a regular old shit show over here so just excuse me as i blow my nose i think all three of us are just <laughs> a bundle full of like happiness and butterflies and rainbows right now <laughs> it's a pleasure to be around right now Let's i'm all bloated my eyes are watering like crazy i feel like i have a brick sitting on my face or like someone's fat ass is sitting on my face right now <laughs> Like, I just feel like, oh, and I have a, a dull headache. So we're all going to just have fun together we're on this show. Sunshine. We're just such great. No, but at least we can laugh about it, right? Like, yeah. that's the whole point. And that's the highest level of spirituality. My teacher will tell you that all the time. Um, Guruji used to kick people out of the shala if they took it too seriously. It's serious. But if wow. you take it to the point where you're taking it too seriously, he would tell you to go. You have to be able to laugh. You know, you have to, that, that, and that's one thing like darkness doesn't understand. That's the biggest weapon we have against the darkness is our ability to laugh. You want to freak a demon out? Just start laughing. They, they don't know what to do with it. Right. They don't know how to do with it. They don't, they don't know how to deal with it. That's a, that's the full vibration of God is that laughter and that, cause that, cause laughter comes from a place of love, right? It's like, it's like you put love on a, on a, um, a washing machine or a dryer and just shake it up a little bit. That's your laughter, right? That's that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that laughter coming out. That image in my head. Well, I got the dryer going right now. I can hear it. So I, when I was really cold, I pulled the dryer and I was like, oh, it's so warm when you pull the clothes out of the dryer. And now I got more, more clothes in the dryer. And anyway, but Stephanie knows I do, I do laundry all the fucking time because I am so sweaty most days. I do too, though. <laughs> I do too. And that's, I just, yeah, I just got to get that clean. But anyway, so what we're going to start off today was we're going to go through some of you guys' questions 
And then we're going to move into the conversation around psychedelics as well, because I'm going to be honest with you guys. You guys know I love microdosing. I did my dose this morning before coming on. So we're going to talk about where psychedelics and plant medicine actually um, work in the spiritual community, because they can be used just for fun and partying, but there's also a medicine to them as well. And so we're hopefully if we if we don't if it if it gets too long before we get to that topic today we'll we'll talk about it next time but that's kind of our our loose our loose outline our plan for the viewers watching right now. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about some things that some questions that people had. Um the first thing I want to talk about is the va- is the value of the teacher. Okay? And I think people are really confused about what that is and what that looks like. So when we think about a teacher in yoga and I, and I don't blame you for being confused because we've been inundated in the United States with fake yoga, with uh, yoga that I believe has been inverted by the controllers. Okay. So just because there's a yoga studio on like every corner of every street in America doesn't mean that they're real yoga shalas. So what is a teacher? A teacher is not an instructor. They're not someone that you're just going to go to their class every once in a while and they're going to choreograph it for you. And that's that a teacher is someone who you actually takes you on as a student and they become invested in you as a student. A teacher also has high credentials of education. So there's only 500 authorized teachers in the world. I'm one of them. Okay. Cause it takes so long to get that authorization, but that's what you want. You want someone that's gone through years and years and years of education. And on top of that, years and years and years and years of practice themselves. Yeah, that's the thing about yoga, about the the real traditional yoga. I can't teach you something that I've never practiced. So in order for me to be authorized to teach in the Mysore room, which is what I was doing before YouTube, I had to have completely completed both primary and second series. I've completed both of those physically. So that's 15 to 20 years of practice because it takes about 10 years to go through primary series. You're still considered a beginner student until the 10 year mark in traditional yoga. All right. So when you walk into a traditional Mysore room or you're working with a traditional teacher, first of all, hopefully by that point, the ego of the teacher is gone because they've had their ass kicked so many times that they're very humble themselves. But in being humble, they also understand tough love. They're gonna be able to keep you honest with yourself. And that's a big thing. We have blind spots. We all have blind spots. And so for me, I don't take excuses. Like I just don't. Like what if you're if you have a fever, you're not supposed to practice because your body's already creating that heat, right? So that's when you rest. Or for a woman, when you're on your period, you need to rest. I will say if you're surviving Hurricane Ian right now, that's, an ex- that's a good excuse not to practice. Okay? But other than that, a teacher is going to call you out on these excuses because they're not real. It's your, you trying to dodge the work, whether you realize it or not. Because the work in true spirituality isn't rainbows and sunshine. It's a lot of tears It's a lot of, I tell my students all the time, it's a lot of realizing how you're an asshole sometimes. That's a hard pill to swallow when you're working through your practice and you realize that you've been an asshole because something in you isn't healed that you didn't realize wasn't healed. And you didn't realize that you were behaving this way because of that. When you make that realization, that's a shitty feeling to then work through. Right. But it is kind of like I see kind of like and I've never been through the 12 step program like Emmy has. But I see almost like when you're taking accountability and having to make amends for things, it's kind of the same thing in yoga. When you start to make those realizations, you you have to learn to forgive yourself Mm -hmm. and understand that you were broken. But now you have the opportunity to heal that. So what do I mean by there are no such things as excuses? There literally are none. I just listed off the, the handful of things that are a good excuse. So. I, I know a lot, I've gotten a lot of people email me about certain physical limitations you perceive you have, like a knee issue or arthritis. Um, and I'm just going to say this. Uh, that's normal. If you have a human body, you're going to have, that's the point of having a body. Every human body has an injury somewhere. Every human body has something going on 
that the doctors are going to label as a disease or a disorder. And if you know what that is, if you know what it is, then you're in an incredible spot. If you know you have arthritis, like I know I have arthritis. I know that's a, that's an anxiety disorder. Okay. So now I can work through it differently in my practice. Cause I know your body didn't just manifest these. I don't even like that word manifest. We're going to use it. Your body didn't just manifest these issues just because it's hereditary. Your body does everything your psyche told it to do. And why your psyche is telling it to do things is because there's a fear or there's an anger or there's a hurt. There's some emotion that's causing that direction to happen. And mm -hmm. so if we don't deal with those emotions, if we don't deal with that imbalance in this life, it's not going to go away. Listen, I am the queen of trying to ignore shit. If we could just ignore something until it went away, I would have already been in like the seventh heaven by now. I would have already been like owning my own planet by now. Like that's, but, but that's not how that works. Right. And, and as I said, God, God, we're eternal souls. So, so God doesn't care how long it takes you to figure it out. If you got to keep coming back with the same issues until you finally go, you know what, this is coming from me. I'm not a victim. I'm actually the perpetrator. And now I'm going to work through it. Then things start to shift. Bryce, can we quickly address the woman who had the question? She is a paraplegic. Mm -hmm. All of her money, it goes to her daughter. And so what would you suggest in a case where someone literally cannot? Uh, I know we discussed this over the phone, but to the audience, what would you suggest for that person who literally cannot move? So first of all, once again, even though you cannot move your body, find a teacher. So what the teacher is going to do is going to teach you to visualize the practice. There was an article written about this um, years ago. A woman was in a full body cast in the hospital. And every day she would wake up early in the morning and she would breathe through her practice in her mind. In her mind. And she would take the inhale and she would see herself lifting her arms up. Exhale, see herself folding. And she was slowly breathing through it as if she were doing it right? Because everything comes from the mind anyway. So if you can find a teacher to teach you how to work with you on what this looks like and to sit there and go through that with you. So every day you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you sit there and you visualize yourself physically doing the practice. That's your practice. Now I'm going to bring into to this conversation, what we talked about on the phone too. Now she said all of her money goes to her daughter. That she's very she's strapped for money. A lot of people are very strapped for money. Now we discussed this over the phone, and I did not know this. So you had said, Well, have they looked? Have they seen what the prices are? Have they tried to work with the teacher? And I said, I honestly wouldn't look myself because most people don't work with you. Now, what did you tell me about that? Corporations, we, need to, we need to address this. Corporations might not work with you, but yoga shalas are not corporations. Yoga shalas are small businesses. We have students at AYA right now that practice for free because they can't afford it. I'll tell you at AYA, our, our tuition is 160 a month for unlimited Mysore. A lot of our students pay 100. A lot of our students will um, go out, I mean, uh, go out and do uh, social media marketing in exchange for class packages, or go out and put flyers up in exchange. The, t the teacher wants you there. Trust me, a teacher wants you to be in that room or they want to work with you. And so if money is an issue for you, just talk to the teacher. Be honest. Listen, yoga teachers don't make a lot of money. Everything we make, we put into going back to India for our further education. All right, we understand. Can we direct people to uh, a place where they could look up someone who is traditionally licensed or authorized i wish i could there used to be on, on the website for kpj where i we used to all be listed but they took the website down to revamp it and in india um that could take five years because that's just small but that's just india so what i'm going to tell you this is what you can do so if you're tr if you're interested in traditional yoga and i'm going to put these on the screen the three traditional yogas are ashtanga which is my lineage sivananda yoga and Iyengar yoga those are the three that are real yogas that are left. The rest of them are not real. They're what we call contemporary. 
they're basically a, a bastardization of the real yoga. But now I would always prompt you to go to real the real thing for many reasons. We're going to get into one is for your safety, which we're going to get into as well. So what I would suggest people doing is Googling Ashtanga yoga or Googling Iyengar yoga or Googling Sivananda yoga in your area. See what pops up. Now, there are a lot of fake Ashtanga studios out there. There's nothing we can do to stop the people who steal and invert. We can't, we can't stop them, right? So then what I would suggest is you go to the website and you read the teacher's bio. If the teacher is authorized, it will say it on his or her bio. It will say authorized by Sharat Joyce or authorized by Patabi Joyce of KPJAYI of India. If they're not, there are some good Ashtanga teachers who aren't necessarily authorized, but are assistants to an authorized teacher. All right. Cause it takes a long time to get authorized. And sometimes people assist for years before they go off to India for themselves. And so if there is someone teaching who's not authorized, but it, but assist an authorized teacher assist, you know, you just follow the bio basically. If in my opinion, the yoga Alliance, in my opinion, is a complete inversion of true yoga. I believe it's cabal controlled. So if you see somebody that is affiliated with the yoga Alliance, in my opinion, do not go to their classes. There are safety factors in this as well. It's not just about the integrity of the philosophy. There's also physical safety factors, which we're going to get into in a second as well. Okay. If, if somebody says, Oh, I just went through this teacher training and that's it. They don't have a teacher. Why would you go to someone who doesn't have a teacher? Why are you going to put your, because when you have a te when you have a teacher, you, part of that is surrendering to the teacher. Part of that is knowing the teacher is going to piss you off and the teacher knows they're going to piss you off because shadow work is hard and people want to be coddled and people want to be comforted. And it's not, that's just not going to happen. And so the teacher is going to have to be tough with you and not coddle you. And so why would you want to go to someone who's doing that for you? Who's not accountable to their own teacher. I can tell you exactly who my teachers are and they know who I am. They have my phone numbers, you know? So, so that, so my students, when I'm tough on my students, they know that I'm doing it from a place of love and it's been done to me too, multiple times before I even step foot in, into taking the authority of a Mysore room. Yeah. Now, Bryce, um, we talked about too. you know, travel. Most people don't live near their teachers. Yep. They, and, and so that I know traveling, sometimes people live in these big states and they're very rural. Um, and so they might have to go to the inner city um, for, you know, practice and whatnot. So how would we address that for those people? So that's normal. Believe it or not, that's extremely common and extremely normal in a traditional yoga environment. My teacher for many years before I went to India was David Greek, who was just back here in Atlanta this past week. Um, and he's, he's based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And so I would travel, I would go once a month, once every six weeks, something like that. I would fly up to Philadelphia, 45 minute flight, and I would practice with him for a few days. And he knew I was coming in, like I would schedule it with him so that he would work with me intensely for those days that I was there. And then he would give me stuff to work on. So I'd come home and practice. Some teachers will then ask you to like film your practice, send it to them. So they, they keep it. They text you during the day to make sure like, I, this is a, this is a teacher guys. This is not an instructor at a fitness class. This is a teacher. They'll call you. They'll talk to you. They'll make sure you keep your practice up. You know, um, David, kids. Okay, Oh, you can bring kids to the Shala for sure. I so, wanted to address that because many people have small little children and they, and the one thing they say is, well, how do I get my practice? And I have nobody to watch my kids. Um, you know, I don't get to sleep at room. night so that I don't sleep. And I, you know, so it's like, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to address the problems that I can actually understand being, I used to be a single mom. Uh, and to be honest with you, I think I've always felt like I've uh, been a single mom anyways, regardless, but, um, you know, it's just one of those things where I, I empathize, but also too, I understand that we can't also hold ourselves back and we still have to take accountability. No. And I want to challenge you guys. Are you using your kids as an excuse? And I know you're not doing that intentionally. And that might, that might trigger people because if it does trigger you, then there's a reason why you're triggered. So make sure you're not using your kids as an excuse not to do the work because kids mm -hmm. come into the shala all the time. 
I was telling Stephanie, a student I've had for years now, her son is now 15 years old. And when I first met him, he was like a little three, four year old and um, Malik. And I can't believe he's 50. He used to sit in my lap. He would come and like sit in my lap. Sometimes when I'd be sitting watching, he'd come and like sit in my lap sometimes while, while I was teaching, she would bring him in early in the morning. And at the beginning of the class, she'd make a little pallet in the back of the room for him to sleep. And he would sleep in the back of the class while, while people, while everyone was practicing. Didn't you say um, Sherat used to hold the babies sometimes? Oh, yeah. You can see pictures of Sherat holding babies while he's teaching. David Greig, there's pictures of David okay. Greig with kids on his shoulders. While he's adjusting someone, a kid's on his shoulders. Yeah. This is one of the differences between authentic yoga and yoga at a studio. Because yeah. you wouldn't be able to bring a baby into... Like, real traditional yoga is a complete lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. And if, if you really like, I, I used my kids as an excuse and I didn't really, I didn't really deeply understand or know that I was doing that until I got to the point where I wanted my yoga practice mm -hmm. more than I wanted the excuses. And, you know, I set uh, a certain time um, out of the day and it's usually before my youngest wakes up. Um, but if he does wake up, he knows that's mom's time and, you know, he can join me if he wants to, or he can go do something else. But, um, it's, and, and if you're not to the point where you don't want, if you want, don't want to do it, that's okay. That's okay. That's just where you're at. Um, don't, don't force it and don't rush through trying to learn all these poses really quick, just to say that you can you can do a series yeah. like we'll get, only, we'll get into that because yeah. a big topic you just brought up is about what you're doing in the poses but you're right and if, if, you, if you're not if you don't want to do it then then that's fine just don't use your, your children as an excuse for why you're not doing it and yeah no that is you're, you're correct i mean there i mean there's a strictness in the miso room for the students but as far as the children that come in there Listen, in, in Ashtanga Yoga, we have six different series in Ashtanga Yoga. There's only one person living right now that's practiced all six series. That's how fucking hard it is, right? I mean, I don't want to get past fourth series. Fourth series looks like a damn exorcism to me. But that's how extreme it is. Like, most people practice between... Most people never get out of primary series. That's how difficult it is. Um, it's it's that way for a reason. It's supposed to be difficult. There's And as uh, Todd has said this before, as... um. There are six different series. So as some you're always being, you're always being challenged. There's always going to be a room for challenge. If you're someone that's super athletic, super bendy, you might have to get to third or fourth series before you meet that resistance and meet that challenge. That's how it's designed. David Grieg, my teacher used to say people who struggle in primary series, they're the lucky ones because their karma came up early. They're the lucky ones. They met, they met that resistance early, but we'll talk about that because that's also a sign of the times as far as we have the Instagrams, we have the internet. And so people are more, more um, enthralled in the, in the majesty of these postures versus what the postures are actually doing and, and the, how, it, how long it takes to get there. Well, so let's, let's touch on this subject really quick. So you brought up the social media thing and the, the, the way it looks magical and everything. First of all, when you get on your damn mat, don't expect like to, to do the, when you're doing like, um, say the Sanskrit words for me, like when you do the kickback or the jump back, it's a bit, taking a vinyasa. Okay. You told me that takes literally like six to seven years sometimes. Right. So the thing is when you're, if like I, um, I prep, Bryce, you, you uh, did the practice with me and, and you gave me stuff to work on. And so I'm now following the series through um, a video that I follow. Um, and I only get a certain way, a certain, I don't go through the entire thing. I, I end up at um, Navasana and then I do the I do the three ending poses like you had told me to do so that I'm ending off, you know, um, how would you say I'm ending neutral. off neutral? Mm -hmm. neutral. And, okay. Okay. Let's go with that for a second. Cause yeah, this is a really good point. That's what I was saying. We were going to get into this when it comes to the yoga postures, the, uh, we call them asanas. So the word asana very loosely means posture, but the deeper de definition is a seat for meditation. That's what asana means. It's a seat for meditation. Now, all of these yoga postures 
are opening specific channels within your body. Now you think about when we go, when builders go to build a, ho build a hotel or build a building, they're having to dynamite. Oh, I guess you to go to the bathroom, blow up, uh, blow up tunnels, blow up stuff like re it's, it's, it takes a while. And so when we're building our, these postures within our bodies, it's going to take years for them to get to the point of the way they look on Instagram. Nobody's putting on Instagram, the postures they're struggling with. If yeah. you watch somebody on Instagram, it's a posture. They're going to trust me for marketing purposes. I've done this before. I'm not, I'm going to only put the postures on marketing that I know I do well, because that's going to allure people into your business. Right. But that's not, you know, um, when you do YouTube, when you're at that point where you can make a YouTube video, it's because you've done this for like 20 years. So yes, you don't expect to look like them. No. And, no. and that's a little, and we have to also remember this idea of humility too. So there, there comes a respect when you have been practicing this, you know how hard it is. And you see somebody who is dedicated and is, and has a clean practice, what we call a clean practice. There's a level of humility for yourself, you know? And I don't, I don't, but in that saying that, like it, 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 your yoga practice should be what we call your sadhana, your sadhana. That's your devotion. It's your devotion. Your practice is your devotion every day because it's really about you and God on that mat. And you're, yeah. you're, bringing, you're bringing yourself and your physical body, the, the physical body being the Shakti of the soul, you're bringing it to a place where you are intentionally triggering and highlighting the issues, the attachments that you have, because that's getting deep into the philosophy of yoga. Basically what Patanjali, and we talked about this last week, so you have the three superstars of yoga, if this was an, as my philosophy teacher in India says, if this were a movie, the three superstars would be Prakriti, Purusha, Ishvara. Okay. So these are all Sanskrit words. So Prakriti means nature. So it's your body. And again, as we said last, last week, the rules of Prakriti, Prakriti is the only thing that has rules because it has a birth, a life and a death. And so because it has a birth, a life, and a death, it's constantly changing. It's constantly in a state of change. I mean, we started off this video from with me telling you guys I'm PMSing. How, how, how big a property is that? My uterus, for a woman, your uterus literally is the best example of property with the birth, a life, and a death because we have it once a month. We build up the lining. We drop an egg. Nothing happens. We lose the lining. Birth, life, death, Right. So, um, and so because of that, that's where we get this delusional attachment to property. Property is the Shakti of the soul. It's meant to be experienced by the soul. So the soul can know itself, but it's, it's also not the soul. The soul will then leave the body at some point and will go on for eternity. Now, according to the yoga sutras, even though God lives in nature, the thing that connects us to God is Parusha is our soul not our nature. Our nature is just an experience for us to know ourselves so that we understand we are a soul connected to God. And so what we do with the yoga asana is we're taking the biggest, I mean, your house is property. This earth is property. Everything in your life is property. So when you, you're using your body, this thing that feels pain, this thing that is experiencing knee problems, hip problems, shoulder problems, and you're actually moving into a practice like yoga where you're really digging deep into these pathways, you're coming up against yourself. And so if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling angry, yay, the practice is working. You're not supposed to feel good. That doesn't come until later. All right. So if, you, if you're feeling frustrated or angry, that means the practice worked. Yes. I about threw in the towel the other day. I was telling Bryce, I was like, maybe I should just pull back. Bryce is like, no. It's working. No, well, it's working. That's, the that's awesome that, that you're frustrated. That. That's the beauty of having a teacher. There's so many, there's so many times where I'm like, oh my God. I, nothing's coming out of this. I feel fatter than I ever felt before. And I'm just having one of those days. And Bryce is like, no. No. Why are you going to quit now? This is what is getting interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's like, ooh. ooh. This is where I got my, my microphone because my mic is on. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> like, this is where it's interesting. This um, is, yeah. yeah. 
But that's the beauty of having a teacher. The teacher holds you accountable and keeps pushing you forward when you are about to quit because we all need that because we all get in those moods where we're just like, I've had it. I'm done. I'm just, I'm over it. And the teacher's like, no, no. Like you said, this, this is where it's getting interesting. Um, just really quickly, Bryce, for those who might feel like they literally can't even do like the sun salutation because they're, they are really like, um, they're, they're overweight. What would you suggest to them to do before they do yoga? Maybe. That's, well, you can do bar, but honestly, like yoga, the, the primary series of yoga's yoga or of Shanga's yoga, Jikitsa, which is physical therapy. And that's one of the biggest side effects of a six day a week Ashtanga practice is people we have a, we have a joke. We call it Ashtangorexia because people get, get dropped so much weight when they're doing it six days a week. Um, because it's it, your body, cause it's a physical therapy. And so and as we, when we talk about weight issues too, we, we spoke on, this is one of the most common things as well. Well, food's not making you fat. There's something in you that's wounded and the practice is going to pull that out of you, right? The practice is going to pull it up and show it to you. And then what you do with it from there is your choice. And that's what, you know, we, we're in this, this, this community or this, this time period. We're like, well, if it doesn't feel good, if it doesn't feel right for you, don't do it. That's the worst advice to give to a beginner yoga student. You're going to have to trust your teacher. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to have a good teacher. Back to the yoga asana. So in traditional yoga, we talked about this last week. In traditional yoga, the teacher does not choreograph the class. It's already on a system. Because these, these postures, it's like, Stephanie, you worked in the medical industry. Yep, if sure you, did. If you opened up a pharmacy with all yeah. those drugs and just said, oh, go have at it, take what you want. Oh, God. You, that pro person would probably kill themselves, wouldn't they? Uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because there's contradictions to yeah. some meds, but the same goes for yoga. Exactly. So why are you going to go into a studio and just do a free-for-all with the yoga asana when these asanas are so fucking potent well you said you start off getting your heart rate going mm -hmm. and then you do um like the on the feet where um the the so yeah so there is a, there is like a circuit training. yeah and you flush so there is a circuit training to this so the sun salutations is going to get your heart rate up that's what surya namaskar means that's the sanskrit for sun salutation it's not about worshiping the sun if someone's telling you that then they are really not educated surya is the is the is the emblem is the mascot if you will for prana why is the sun the mascot for prana because prana is your upward moving energy mm -hmm. it's the it's the sweat it's that they call it chi and tai chi it's your life force and then the moon is the apana is the downward flowing energy so if we see so in namaskar like nothing drives me crazy or -er. Then when I see like the, the fake yoga, we're like, namaste. That's the stupidest shit. That's like saying aloha. <laughs> namaste is literally just like saying hello. That's what it is. And so when teachers close out with that, I'm like, oh, they don't know what they're doing. They've never had a Sanskrit teacher. That's bad. That's bad. Real bad. My teacher doesn't say that. He's just like, bye. <laughs> Bye. See you later. <laughs> so see you tomorrow. Um, so, okay. So namaskar is a greeting. So what are you doing in your sun salutations? What is that? What does that Sanskrit tell you? Surya namaskar. So Surya is the prana. Namaskar is a greeting. You're warming your body up. Hello to yourself. You're igniting your prana. <laughs> you're supposed to be sweating. You're, you're getting you out. Yeah. And you I do. love the sun salutation so much. The I love it. I love they, it. And so we have Suri Namaskar A, which is how we start. That's the very masculine sun salutation. It's very linear. And then when you get to Suri Namaskar B, so there's nine vinyasas in Suri Namaskar A. Ekam inhale, Dwe exhale, Trini exhale, Chachwadi, Pancha Shat, Sapta Ashtana, Va, Samastitihi, point zero position. Then you get to Suri Namaskar B. There's 17 vinyasas in Suri Namaskar B. Suri Namaskar B starts to get the hips involved. So that's when we take the energy, we, wait, we first wake the energy up in a very linear way, very masculine way. And then we go into Surya Namaskar B where we start to get it in a reciprocal way, which is the feminine. So there's a purpose behind this. So we're starting off linear because when we practice in Ashtanga, we, we practice during Brahma Morta, which is between two o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning. 
So at that time of day, that's the time of God, Brahma Morta, that's the time, that's what it means, time of God. That time, that's a very holy time of day. And in fact, it, once you start getting up, and I've gotten so many emails from people that are getting up at that time of day and just going for walks, and you're telling me how much it's affecting you, it's life changing. It's mm -hmm. still hard to get up at that time for sure. But once you're up and you start moving, you understand why it's Brahma Morta. It is the my stomach just growled so oh, loud. It's your, your stomach saying, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not picking it up. And I have my microphone over here because it's not working on my computer. I'm like, no, that's okay. <laughs> that's why her stomach dies. It's not coming from the other end. Um, <laughs> Bryce, what would, what would you recommend? Like all of the, um, everything that you just listed in the um, sun salutation A and B, sounds like foreign language. What would you tell someone like, okay, so what helped me really helped me was reading the book, The Power of Ashtanga Yoga by yeah. um, McGregor. Yeah. Kino McGregor. Yes. I know. Yes. Her. I punched um, her. So funny story. I punched Kino McGregor's husband, Tim Feldman. <laughs> Tim Feldman is an incredible teacher. I mean, he is my favorite teachers he's also an authorized teacher he's down in miami he pulled me this is he pulled me into a this i was in second series of the back then called kapotasana that there anybody who practices kapo knows the struggle it's a deep back bend. i literally came out he pulled me into and i socked him in a miso room and he grabbed my my forearms and pulled me right back down and get it back into the posture again and after i was over after we finished i felt so bad i was like i'm so sorry i've never punched anyone before and he was like it's cool my wife punches me all the time his wife is kino the girl who wrote that book and then in india my first trip to india i actually i got really sick i get always get sick in india but Tim heard that I was sick. And so very kindly, he went and got some papayas and stuff, some coconut water, and he brought it over to my house. And he knocked on my house and I opened the door and I just I threw up. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you have a good relationship with him, don't you? <laughs> so I love Tim Feldman so much. He is like the one of the best teachers that you will. And Tim Feldman is someone I, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't mind me saying this because he talks about this all the time. He was a dancer from a really he's from um Copenhagen I want to he lives in Miami now but he's 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 from Europe and he was a dancer and he was in New York for a while and then he was in a horrible accident and I want to say I think he like fell off of a, a cliff or something. he broke like almost every bone in his body like he was in a terrible accident and then after that he started practicing Ashtanga yoga and so he understands so when he's running your the mice room and he's tough on you you kind of understand like he's he's been through this too he knows what pain feels like in the body you know, but yeah, the power of Ashtanga yoga, I'll put that link down in the description box below with Kino. Now, the best thing to again, as I've been saying is find a teacher. Now a teacher, and as far as what they do with you, I can't tell you what the teacher is going to do with you, because they're going to have to understand you, they're gonna to have to have a conversation with you to understand what's going on with you. So that they know how to how to keep you keep your action plan going. Just because so if you have an injury, like we talked about our student with several palsy last week, he modifies, right? There's, there's, there's uh, adjustments made to his practice to accommodate the cerebral palsy. Yeah. So when I practiced through a bo broken sacrum, I was not doing the full practice with the broken sacrum. I was modifying a lot, but I still got on. I know I have a friend up in Canada who had such a horrific back injury that he could hardly move. And you know what he did every morning? He would go to the shala, lay his mat down, and then lay on his mat and just laid around people practicing. But he still would go to the shala every morning while it healed just to be around the energy of people practicing and the breathing. Right? So it's it's that the sign. Mind, the it's mind fine. can heal too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you're really that immobile, it's amazing what the mind can do. And that's that's a you know, the two stories you've said is like a testimony to that. So, I mean, look at, you guys don't know what I looked like when I was at my sickest. You can ask David. He had to carry me up the stairs to bed because I literally couldn't get up the stairs. I couldn't walk. I have slip discs in my lower spine. I have them and also my cervical spine too. I've had, um, I've had uh, uh, physical therapy on my spine before. 
Um, so I have spinal issues. I've had spinal issues since I was about six or seven years old. I also have scoliosis. Um, and I have, um, I've had a lot of medical issues. I will say this ever since I started getting on my mat every day and exercising, I'm more mobile than I have been probably since I was about six or seven years old. Yeah. Because I've been in chronic pain since I was a little kid because I had gone through some horrific stuff in my early years and that and it was the manifestation of that trauma. Yeah. That ended up in my body. So what I'm now doing is I'm transmuting the energy from that trauma and I'm I'm turning it into gold now. You know what I mean? That's that's part of it. You transmuting that energy and you're healing yourself. And as I'm doing that, I'm actually not only healing myself, but as somebody who channels people's energy for, for readings and such, I can channel a whole lot better now. And my channel is now open because I'm not all in, all in the third eye. I'm also in my lower self too. I'm bringing myself back into my body. So it's life changing. And if I can do it, you know, and I'm, I'm not paraplegic, there's people with worse injuries than me, but I guarantee you, you will find such benefit. And also there's this sense of it's a healthy pride when you take it into your own hands and heal yourself. Well, it's rather it, than just a fix it button. Kind yeah. Of and it shows you like, so you also, the, and Shanti's big on this as well, because she's Shanti from Aquarius Rising Acra. She's India trained as well. And she, and she talks about this and this is what we're talking about with Purusha and Prakriti and with Shiva Shakti. So your life, all of your injuries, every sickness you've had, every trauma that's happened to you, you created that for you to experience it. That's a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow. A lot of people would rather pretend to be, the, be in that, uh, that delusion that they're the victim. But for me, when you start to understand that on a very conscious level, then you realize since you're, you're not the victim, you're the perpetrator of yourself. And when you realize that everything changes all of a sudden, well, everything, everything we go through, we, we chose it before we incarnated. Yeah. And that's part of that delusion. So if you spend your whole life being a victim to your diagnosis by the doctor and you just, Oh, I'm got arthritis. I can't do it. I've got arthritis or, Oh, I can't, you know, I've got a slip disc. I got five in my back. Oh, I can't do it. Then you are missing the point completely of this great awakening. And you're going to have to come back and probably relive the same injuries over and over again until you realize you're the one that can feel it. The doctor is not going to heal it. You know, the opening. So somebody asked about the chanting. So what you're asking about, uh, Emmy, is the Sanskrit. So this is a foreign language. Sanskrit is like Latin in the sense that it is a dead language. It's not spoken anymore, um, like Latin. But Stephanie and I have kind of looked into this. Sanskrit is the light language, whereas Latin is the demonic language. So Sanskrit is your teacher. So the sister science to yoga is Ayurveda. And that's where the doshas come from, all that kind of stuff. The three rules and elements of Ayurvedic medicine, there are three of them. Breath which we'll talk about breath because someone had a question about that. Breath, food, which again comes to the dosha system, and vibration. What's vibration? Speaking. It's your voice. And sound. sound. So Sanskrit, if your teacher is not speaking in Sanskrit in your class, is not calling the posters in their Sanskrit name. You need to find a new teacher. Okay. Cause when let's take the posture Utkatasana, for example, cause Utkatasana is probably one of the main postures that's done wrong in Western yoga and it's translated wrong. So Utkatasana, people will say that's chair pose. First of all, it doesn't translate to chair pose. Second of all, that's not its name. My name is Bryce. My name isn't, you know, Shirley. It's not Susan. It's Bryce. Utkatasana is the name of that posture. It's not chair pose. How disrespectful can we be, really? 
And so what starts to happen is people start to do it like this. Like we see people doing it like that. That's not Utkatasana. Utkatasana, your knees are bent, they're zipped together. You're, you're curved a little in your spine. Your hands are right above your head and your head is way back. So there are different patterns of energy being opened in the body versus this shit. I don't know what this is. So, but when the teacher says Utkatasana to you, just hearing that, mm -hmm. the vibration has already started the healing process within to your psyche. Right? So I don't even know. I got to the point now. I don't even know, like, especially in second series, I don't even know what the English translation is for some of these postures. I don't care. But that doesn't matter. Because it's the Sanskrit that matters. And most Ashtanga students are very, very well versed in Sanskrit. So even people who don't teach at that point, just from being in the Meister room and hearing. So the opening chant we do. So the point of chanting. So in Ashtanga yoga, all the, all the, all the um, traditional yogas are going to have an opening chant. The opening chant that we do in Ashtanga yoga, ours and Iyengar's are very similar. It's a prayer. It is a prayer. And it's basically asking that I took like a three hour class on this once. You don't need to take a three hour class on it. Basically, it's asking that your poisons, so your attachments, your issues will be brought to the surface so that they may be healed. Mm -hmm. That's basically the gist of it. The opening chant. Now, the other aspect of chanting is focusing the mind. So there's a, so when people start to chant, they, they're getting your, your, uh, you'll see in, in, in Mysore, especially the Mysore class, which we can talk about the differences between the two students, especially students who've been doing this for a while, they throw their mat down and they just do their chant by themselves before they start their practice. Cause it's getting their mind ready. It's getting their mind focused for practice. So and yeah, it is, it is a, sacred. It's very sacred. It's sacred. Yeah. We, and all, all, all of the richness, all of the beauty has been removed with the yoga alliance. Uh -huh. and it's, it's basically like, um, it's like you're, you're taking the outer shell and throwing away the fruit, like the best part of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And it also is kind of the sign of the times, the way they've trained us to be. It's like, we don't value hard work anymore. Yeah. We just want to, we want to be it. We want to be it now. And so they're offering these 200 hour teacher training courses Y'all do not be, that's a scam. That's mm -hmm. a scam. Don't do it. Go to India. The same price you pay for that is going to get you to India. And India is going to really humble you. It's, I mean, the, my first trip to India, there comes a point where you're like, what the fuck did I just do? I mean, there are stories of people hiding behind trees because they are scared to go into the Shala because they're literally on the other side of the world. The culture is so different. There's such a huge culture shock. You know, it, you, you're, you get deli belly and then you're dealing with a teacher that's not, you know, for me with Sharad, he speaks perfect English. Guruji didn't speak. I think he picked, I think, I personally think Guruji would pick and choose when he knew English, which I kind of wish I could do that sometimes too. Um, you know, and so, I mean, it, it's in people would get like with traditional yoga, you're not just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to yoga class. No, it's, there's a serious mental like devotion to it. Where you, you, you are a little bit nervous because there is going to be some hard work. There's going to be some pushing. It's, the, the adjustments in, in traditional yoga are not just soft little rubs on the back. They're literally cracking your body. It's like, an, it's like a, when I adjust someone, it's a literal crank. It's yes, a, it is. It's a crank. We're cranking it. I would know personally. <laughs> well, let's talk about that for a second, why that's necessary. So I don't know if you guys, I, I mean, you might be uh, familiar with rolfing, the practice of rolfing. It's like a deep fascia massage. There's a rougher below uh, AYA. Um, I've, I've done it. A, listen, I went to this Indian guy once in India and I've never cried that hard in my life. He did something with my thighs and I thought I was going to die right then and there. But what it rolfing does is it works with the fascia to release emotions. Now, Ida Rolf, who is the woman who came up with this, she spent like all these decades studying human behavior and human patterns. And she realized that human beings have the ability to shift their own patterns to an extent, but we all have blind spots. We all have patterning. We're not going to be able to break by ourselves, And so that's why the adjustments are important because 
the teacher coming in every day and cranking you into a posture, eventually there's going to be a breakthrough and the body is going to create that new opening and that new pattern. Same thing with rolfing, that there had to be some sort of uh, external intervention in order for some things to release. And so that's why now, as far as like the hardcore cranks, you know, I often say with my student, it's like dating, you know, when a new student comes into the MISO room, I'm not going to give them the hardcore cranks. First of all, I need to get to know their body. So as a teacher, I need to see where their patterning is, where they're holding that. I need to have that information before I start to move, manhandle them in that way. And on the first date, I mean, some of you guys might jump into bed on the first date, but usually you don't jump into bed with someone on the first date, right? Same thing with, with Ashtanga yoga, you're going to slowly get to know the person so that they can release and trust you because it's going to be painful. You know, it's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah. It's date, you're basically dating your teacher, but there's no, uh, but no hanky. That sounded, that sounded bad. <laughs> Actually. And I was telling you Stephanie, like there, are, we have, um, uh, rules with that. So you know, I'm, I'm kind of teaching Emmy and, and, and Stephanie, but that is kind of actually bending the rules a little bit because I'm their friend. You're not supposed not to. Not when you're teaching them. <laughs> I'm pretty good about changing up when I'm a teacher. You are. As, you're not as, 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 your friend, <laughs> as your friend, I can be like, I know, rule that sucks so bad. I know it sucks so bad. But as a teacher. There I am doing so vinyasa and, and, and not in vinyasas. What is it? Navasana. And you're like, you just don't want to do it. I'm like, I can't hold myself up. You don't want to do it. I'm like, listen, you see that one more time. I know as your friend, I'm like, I know it sucks so bad. It's so hard. But as the teacher, I have to be like, no, you can do it. You can fucking do it. You want to talk about abs burning? Do that. Oh, my God. Well, well so the same rules apply like with, um, with spouses and partners. I can't teach my partner. And that's, that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. Um, my mom used to come to my Meister classes and I would let her come, but I wouldn't adjust her that much because I'm not even anybody that I have a personal relationship with intimate relationship with outside of the yoga shala. I'm technically not supposed to teach. And I understand that. I get why that is. Oh yeah. You have to have that boundary. And so like, if my husband, you know, were in the shala with back in the day, probably like five years ago, 10 years ago, I this practice is so important to me that I would not date somebody unless they were actually an Ashtanga student too. And that is because we get up so fucking early in the morning. There's lots of reasons behind it. First of all, what am I going to have in common with someone who's not working with on themselves? We're on two totally different wavelengths. A lot of people are finding that out with their spouses right now, right? You're on a great yep. awakening and they're dead in the mud, yep. mud right? They don't. So <laughs> I ha even 10 years ago, like, why am I going to date some Joe Schmo? who works a nine to five. No, no. I mean, like in gets drunk on Thursday nights and then has, you know, like goes to the bar on Saturday when I'm literally getting up at three thirty, four o'clock in the morning to go do my sadhana, working my ass off, you know, that there's just not, that there's not no compatibility. And I want to be able to talk to my partner about the philosophy. I want to be able to have that conversation with my partner. Right. And so for a long time, I would only date men who were in Ashtanga yoga. Um, and, and that's, you are going to bed at what time I go to bed at like seven o'clock at night. Like my nine-year-old nephew has a later bedtime than I do, but it's because I'm up super early for Brahma Morta. That's the decision that I've made with my life is to do that. And I've, I've shifted my life around because it is a devotion. It's a sadhana. Your yoga class shouldn't, shouldn't be an extracurricular activity you do for fun. It becomes your devotion. It becomes that part of your life. That is the essence of your life. It, su it supports your life. It gives meaning to your relationship. I have had more experiences with God on my yoga mat when I'm doing, when I'm in my, I'm a hot, sweaty mess and I've got tears running down my face and everything hurts. And I'm being told to do another backbend in that moment by the teacher. God is there. And I'm in that humble place. That's, you know, that's what we say too. You know, uh, Patanjali speaks about this in the sutras. Like, for me, in my experience within my body and how my body is and what my karma is, primary series, when I first learned it, came very easy for me. I went through it really quickly. No problems. Second series is when shit got real because I had had back surgery. I, have ha I do have a lot of held karma. There's a lot of deep backbending in second series, a lot of catching of the ankles 
And so a lot of stuff came up for me in second series. And I had to relearn second series three different times because of issues that were coming up that I had to then go deal with. Okay. So that's where my, so Patanjali says that primary series for me, that's not really my practice. Like I love primary series because it feels good to me. And I'm like, Ooh, look, my, my, my hamstrings are pretty open. This is kind of fun. I can, I'm pretty strong. So, but that's not where my foot, that's not, my mind is like elsewhere when I'm in that practice. I primary series, when I teach primary series now, and I do the count, cause we just count, which we'll talk about that in a second. I go on autopilot half the time when I'm doing the lead because we're not adjusting in lead classes and it's just the ache and inhale, which we'll talk about what that means. And I go on autopilot because it just comes so naturally to me. But second series, the second series now at this point does come very naturally to me. I've worked through a lot of stuff, but that is where I was brought to my knees by my own issues. And so being brought to your knees, that's where you're going to be face to face with God because there's no ego there. I'm there with primary series. So you're, so you're the lucky one. So how much time do you guys have, ladies? I know we, we always, do you guys have a few more minutes to talk about lead? Um, I have about 10 more minutes or so. Well, let me, and we'll continue this. I guess we'll get to, um, uh, we'll get to psychedelics next, the fun stuff. <laughs> we'll get to <laughs> next week. Um, but let me just go ahead and explain the difference between lead and prime, uh, lead and Mysore. So a lead and traditional yoga, once again, there should not be any music playing. Don't go to a yoga class where they're putting fucking music on. Ed specifically says that in the yoga sutras at the end of the second pada, we're trying to control our senses, not entice them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So much shit is coming up in your practice anyway, bare bones when it comes to that, because you don't want to distract yourself from what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. All right. So I posted a video on the, my community tab. I'll show you guys. And I, I encouraged everybody to watch it, especially if they were a little confused between fake yoga and real yoga. It's this one right here. Okay. So I'll leave it up. Uh, yoga Guru Arshra Joy. So this is my teacher in India, the one who's authorized me to teach. So what you're going to see in this video is you're going to see two different styles of, of classes happening. You're going to see a lead primary series and you're going to see a lead second series. and You're going to see Mysore. So lead classes in Ashtanga yoga are the more advanced classes. Okay. Now lead second, you have to be invited to, you can't just show up. And that's the same thing with the Asana anyway. So like I have both Emmy and Stephanie practicing up to Navasana in primaries, which is the halfway point of primary, the back half of primary series, legs start going behind the head. It's very advanced. So most students will be at the first half of primary series for a very long time to prep, to prep their body and their mind to eventually get to the back half. Now, if they were to just do these postures without being given them by the teacher, that's considered stealing. So that's how serious it's taken in traditional yoga, these asanas. Now, Mysore style yoga is the only all levels class that exists in the world, truly. And that's how most of this yoga is practiced. We only do lead class once a week. The rest of the week is Mysore. So what does that mean? So that means that the student, so we open up the shala five o'clock in the morning. Shala closes at like 8, 830 in the morning. So that means that you come in at any point during that time. Give yourself at least an hour. My practice is about two hours, two and a half hours sometimes. Um, give yourself enough time to do your practice. And so what that means is you're walking into the room and you see the video in, in this of people just doing their own. They look like they're doing their own thing. They're not doing their own thing. They're following a system, right? They're following, they're doing the primary series or the second series or the third series. Actually, Mark Roberts is featured a lot in this video. The blonde guy, the also, he's, I, he's one of my favorite people in the whole world. He's one of the 50 people who are actually certified, which David Grieg is as well. And he has got a beautiful practice, but he's one of the most humble human beings you'll ever meet. He's featured a lot in this. You see him doing very extreme asana. So what's happening in Mysore is that the teacher is working with you one-on-one. -on -one. So Mysore is like you're having a private lesson with a bunch of other people in the room, right? You're not going in there and doing whatever the fuck you want. You'll get kicked out real fast if you try to do that. You're following the system. And so people say, well, I don't know the system. Well, then you come to Mysore and you learn it. That's why we, they're teachers. So at AYA, for example, you have the main teacher and then you have three assistants in the room. So your first day, you've never done yoga. You show up to Mysore. One of the assistants will probably get you started teaching you the sun salutations. 
And then every day you build on it and you learn more and more and more. And then the main teacher comes in and really works with you. And when they tell you to stop at a certain place, you stop at that place. And so you work on that every single day. So your first, pra- your first day, your practice might only be like 45 minutes. And then over time, you, you start to learn it. And so oh, once you really learn it, so once you get to about quarter primary series mark, that's when you can come to the lead class and you have to stop at that point in lead as well. So in a lead class in Ashtanga Yoga, you'll see people practicing and you'll see them stop and sit on their mat and wait for the practice to finish because they haven't been given those postures yet. And there's a respect there, right? There, that's about respect. Um, and so most students, though, will, co- will start coming to lead about quarter primary to half primary series. Yeah. And that's done on Fridays and it's just done on account. So if you go to a lead class in Ashtanga Yoga and a traditional, if I'm teaching it, we're going to open with the chant. Everybody comes to Sama Sitihi at their mat, which means point zero position. It's not Tadasana. That's not, that's not Tadasana. That's another, if the teacher's calling that standing position on your mat, Tadasana, you might want to find a new teacher. That's not Tadasana. It's Sama Sitihi. Okay. And so then they count, ache them, inhale. Dway, they're not calling postures in the leg class. They're just counting for you. So everyone stays on the count. So that's why it's the more advanced class than the Mysore. The Mysore is where you're going to get cranked. It's where you're going to get workshopped. It's where the teacher is going to work with you one-on-one. The Mysore is where you're going to see people crying in the corner. The Mysore, you're going to hear thumps. You're going to have people falling on their mat. You're going to hear the F-bomb dropped a lot. You're going to hear people laughing. Um, you're going to see the kid sleeping in the corner. Um, in Mysore, India, Sharat's son will come in with his Nerf gun sometimes. So you're like trying to do a really hard posture and he's up there poof, 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 like shoot, shooting his Nerf, his Nerf toy. That's so cute. That's it's awesome. so annoying when you're, when you're like in a hard that posture. That goes to show you the difference in the, um, in the, 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 uh, the traditional yoga. It's, um. I would say that's definitely more, it's, it's family friendly, you know, it's well, seventh, um, that seventh series is, is family life. So Guruji would say no family life until you complete all six series. Like no one's ready for family life until they've completed all six series of Ashtanga yoga, which is kind of a joke because one person living right now has completed all six series, but that's how hard <laughs> family life is, right? Like you can't, you got to, that's the seventh series is your family life. Right. And so as a, actually in Mysore, India, if you're because we have to wait in the lobby in India because there's so many people to get called in. Whereas at most shallows, you just go in and there's a space. So women who have children or dads who have their kids with them, they get priority. They get to come in first to the Mysore room to practice. And you see kids, I, it's so funny. Last time I was there, there was this kid from Miami, and she would have her headphones on and her iPad every day in like in the room while we were practicing. And sometimes I think she'd for, cause it's all you hear is breathing in the room. And then you hear some conversation here and there or Sharat saying, Hey, next one you come. So it's kind of quiet in the room besides the muffled. And all of a sudden she'd have her headphones on. All of a sudden she'd start singing in the corner with her iPad out loud to whatever she was listening to. And it was adorable. It was the cutest thing in the world. Cause she didn't realize cause she had her headphones on, you know? Um, so that's, yeah, that your children. Can, yeah. It's it, that is a difference We're we're, your children are your seventh series. Sharat will probably come pick them up and carry them around while they're adjusting. And what an incredible, I wish I had grown up that way. I'm jealous of these kids that are growing up in these shalas. From a very young age, they're seeing this, they're seeing what the, and you know, you look at somebody actually asked about this video, like, oh, these people look like they've been doing this for a while or something. I can't remember what the actual quote was. Um, and um, it's just someone said, oh, how does someone even start this practice? Clearly, students built up their ability to do these poses. Um, well, they have teachers. So all the people in that room, well, first of all, Strat's their teacher, but they also have American teachers as well. They have teachers. And if they're doing that in that my room, guess what? You can too. I, there's not one muscle that I have that you don't have. I just have been doing this for many years. You just have to be able to give it time. Listen, I do downward dog and my boobs are right in my face. If I can do, if I can do it, anybody can. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I, cause I know people would might say, well, Bryce, you know, you're, you're thin, you're fit. You're, I'm not fit. I'm not well, thin. And I'm going to tell you that nothing pisses me off more when people say that to me, like nothing will piss me off more than that. How dare it's people hard for it. invalidate my experiences. I've worked through, I've broken my bone. I've broken a couple of bones that I've worked through in this practice. I've literally had sweat, blood, and tears. Yes, I'm thin, but you know what? I'm Vata. You know what that means? 
I don't twist into my joints like you sh I should. I twist into my ligaments and tendons. That's what vatas do. So even though I'm thin, I'm still working through the obstacles of being vata. Yeah. It doesn't mean that there, there's no one out there that's magically better than you or magically. No, we have to get this out of our head. No one's had it easier than you. Mm -hmm. Don't get, if, if you're putting yourself in that position, poor me, woe is me. Oh, I'm so feeble. I'm so, I can't do it. Nobody's had it. We all, no one gets out of this world alive. All of us have struggled. All of us, I've put sweat, blood, and tears into this devotional practice. I've given, I gave up having children to be able to go to India and do this. We've all given the stuff up. And so when people tell me that, oh, you're thin, you're this, you're that. So does that disqualify me? The fact that I have a horrible arthritis, the fact that I, there have been days I've thrown up on my mat, there have been days I've had bloody noses on my mat. What about the time I, I bet you Tim, Tim Feldman, whom I punched, will tell you exactly how hard this practice has been for me. So don't ever say that to someone. So if you find yourself being that person, that's like, oh, well, that person doesn't understand because of what I, that's saying more about you. Well, everybody has different challenges is what we really need to understand. Some people might have the challenge of being overweight. Some people have the challenge of arthritis. Some people have the challenge of, they literally are not mobile. Everybody has a certain challenge and you all signed up for that challenge. Yeah. So what are you going to do about the challenge? Are you going to challenge yourself? to get through that challenge or are you going to finish it in your in, in, in lifetimes to come and i would say if you're that type of person that you find yourself saying that well that person doesn't understand first of all you're perceiving something about somebody else that isn't true second of all you're projecting your insecurities onto that person which isn't fair so if you find yourself being that person that's saying those things i've been doing this for 16 fucking years if I could not get my legs behind my head right now or do a handstand or do a drop back stand up, there would be something wrong with me. That's just science. I've done it six days, six days a week for 16 years. Not five days a week, not four days a week, six days a week for 16 years. Two over two hours a day. That's like, that's, and I had, I had a doctor tell me that once too. Like, you know, you're like, an, you're, you're, you work your body like an athlete, except for athletes don't have, a, a, except for you don't have an off season, you know? And so I, I just want people to put that in perspective. And as a teacher, you want me to be able to do those things with my body so that I can then teach you how to do them with yours mm -hmm. and understand, right? So I would really challenge people not to say those things. Like that's really upsetting. When you disqualify someone because of your perceived, you perceive them as having an advantage that, that you've created when they've maybe not, I know people out there, I was telling Stephanie, as far as like money goes, I know people who go to India, they save up every penny they have just to be able to go to India and study for a couple months. They don't even have a suitcase full of you. They have to rewash the same yoga clothes every day because they've literally spent every money they have just to get to India to study with, with Sharat. Then they don't have a closet full of yoga pants. They can't afford it. They've had to pick and choose. You know, people who live off one meal a day in India because they're saving their money to be able to study and pay tuition. So everybody has, everybody has a cross to bear. Everybody, there's not one person in this world that's going to get out of this world alive. We all have our shit to go through. None of us are, that, that's what makes us connected. That's what gives us empathy and compassion is that we all understand that. And so when you sit there thinking, oh, I can't do this, that's just you being human. And that's where the juice is. Where it's hard is where it's interesting. That's where the telenovela is, right? Mm -hmm. So first things first, find a teacher. Oh, one question I was planning on answering, somebody asked about Hatha yoga. It's not Hatha yoga, guys. It's Hatha yoga. The TH in Sanskrit does not make the same sound as it does in English because it's a different language. All Hatha yoga is, is physical yoga. That's all it is. So any Ashtanga, Ingrid, Sivananda, that's all Hatha Yoga. Any type of posture work is Hatha Yoga. So Ashtanga is Hatha Yoga. Um, there's a great, there's a Hatha Yoga Pradikapa, which is kind of like Yoga Sutras. It was written a little bit later. It's probably only about two. Yoga Sutras is about 5,000 years old. Uh, the Hatha Yoga Pradikapa is about 2,000 years old. 
and the Hatha Yoga Pradikapa, they're teaching you how to be in sadhana, how to be in devotional. And shalas, traditional shalas are supposed to have a, a low door. Don't know why they tell you to have your door really low? To keep the prana in maybe? So that you bow before God, you're forced to bow when you enter into the shala. Mm. You don't see that in your everyday church. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's in the Hatha Yoga Pradikapa. In fact, <laughs> the, our, the entryways to all the fancy churches are for giants. I know, right? No, yeah. No, they, they, have, they have to bow before entering it. So you make sure, and you still, and the door isn't that low in India either, but you still see people in India, we bow to the floor before we come in. You, you crouch down, you bow, and then you come in to take your practice. Think about that, guys. So instead of looking at your practice as some exercise, why don't you, before taking practice, why don't you bow? And see how that changes your perception of what it is you're doing. It's not something that you're doing to necessarily sit there and say, oh, I need a weight loss program. No, it's actually a way for you to connect with the divine. And that weight will fall off. When you, yeah. when you start to correct your own wound, or not correct, but heal your own wounds, all that stuff will correct itself. Because yeah. when, you, when you go on a diet and you just do the crash diets, you're just, you're just curing the symptom. You're putting a Band-Aid on it. But this is going to have you get to the, the root of the wound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's a healing path. It, yes, it is. And the thing is, too, you know, and if people literally don't have any means um, to find a, a authorized teacher for this, too. I mean, what I'll do on my channel is I'll also put Marnie Alton's um, yeah. workouts um, in the description box because she's kick ass. I and mean, I, if you want to do another workout, that's kick ass. Yeah, we were going to get into that. That was going to be the second. We can talk about that next time too okay. about the bar because I actually want to try to. I've talked to Marnie Alton maybe a couple of times in the past. I doubt she remembers, but it, just in communication about some stuff. And I actually want to try to reach out to her and see if she'll come on the channel. I don't know. Oh if my she god, I, oh. I'd love to meet her because she's such a, you know, she um her personality. She gets it. Yeah, she really, truly really gets it. She's very like upbeat, optimistic, but at the same but time, how? she's describing to you exactly what the different um, types. What what do you call it? Not postures, but what she's postures. doing. Yeah, and we'll talk about what she's doing too. We can we can cover that in the next episode because if you are in a position. So the thing about the Austin too, I want to express as well. Find a teacher. I don't know what the teacher is going to tell you about your own situation. That's between you and the teacher, but the teacher also needs to help you practice to keep you safe too, to make sure you're not doing something stupid in your practice, right? That's part of it as well to keep you, your body as safe as possible. If that's not possible, I would suggest you then doing the bar because I don't want anybody getting hurt or going delusional because they're doing a fake yoga, if that makes sense. And I know I had some questions about pranayama, which is breathing, which we'll get to next time as well, because that's a big one. But I will say in the Ashtanga lineage, pranayama is only taught after you complete primary series because the body needs to get real toned before the nervous system can start to be engaged. Pranayama, again, again is that breathing work. Um, prana is life force. Yama is extending, extending the life's capacity through breath. Um, a lot of breath work is taught very wrong in the West. Actually, nothing will make, well, the Yoga Alliance makes Sharat mad, but um, breathing will also make him mad too. It's not Ujjayi breathing. It's not correct in asana. We'll talk about that. It's not belly breathing because you need to have the stomach pulled in. We'll get into that. Okay. So somebody had a question about all you need to worry about in the beginning part of your practice is to just fucking breathe. Easy peasy, right? Like just don't hold your breath. The breath is connected to your nervous system. And so if you do find yourself holding your breath, whether that be in yoga or bar or running or anything you're doing, that's a sign to you. That's information for you to take in. Oh, what in my nervous system is being triggered right now? Cause I'm holding my breath. That's all you need to think about right now. Mouth breathing is stress breathing. Nose breathing is a clearer breathing. Now, again, in the yoga asana, we want you only nose breathing, no mouth breathing. But if you're clogged, if your nose is clogged, then mouth breathe. Right. Don't worry about the deep, deep pranayama practices. We'll talk about those later on. For me, pranayama class is scarier than asana class. I mean, people have, I, there's a, someone that's friends with Todd that went blind for like a day because of he popped something in a pranayama class. So this is intense breath work. And I'll give you a little story. So here, 
in the Western world, we say, God, our days are numbered, right? We say that that's God knows the numbers. Well, in India, they say your breaths are numbered. So you're born only with a certain amount of inhales and exhales. So think about that. If you have anxiety, what happens to your breath? <laughs> but if you can learn to calm the breath down. That's deep. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Now also though, in a in traditional practice, so like you said, the sun salutations, heart rate. So the breath controls the heart or the heart rate controls the breath as well. So if you try to slow the breath down when the heart rate is naturally supposed to be rising, you're going to screw yourself up too. So you have to let the breath get quicker then as well, like a runner's breath. So you start to learn how the breath works, but yes, the bandhas. So the bandhas we kind of spoke about last week, Mola Bandha, uh, Uddiyana Bandha, John Bandha, that's part of pranayama. That's not physical. That's part of breath work, being able to pull up like that. It feels physical, but no, it's part of your breath. The mm -hmm. kundalini rising up and down the spine. You do practices where you work on bringing the breath up and down the spine. Up, and then you have to hold it. That's why, I mean, I've done, D David Grieg, I've done so many pranayamas with him where I literally want to smack him because he has you holding that breath for so long, you spill your face, start to get red. And he tells a story, David Grieg, that when Guruji was older, when he's, before he passed away, he would fall asleep sometimes in pranayama, teaching pranayama. And so he'd have them holding their breath and then they kind of look up and they have to like wake him up to say, inhale. <laughs> so, um, so that's how serious it is, right? You, you shouldn't be taking, if, if there is any type of like weight issue, whether it be underweight or overweight, you should not be doing pranayama right now, first of all, because we need to have proper circulation in the core. So this is why that's so, so for those starting yoga, you're going to hear a lot about the breathing. All you need to know in the beginning, don't stop breathing. Breathe through the nose. Don't try to elongate the breath. Don't belly breathe. Don't do that. Don't belly breathe. You're losing uni on a bundle if you push your belly out. Okay? You want to keep it pulled up. And um, and then otherwise, if you feel yourself stopping to breathe, just note that in your, your, your nervous system. Just And don't freak out about it. Just be like, don't be like, oh, should I stop breathing? Just kind of notice it. Be like, oh, huh. I, I actually, in my practice, I find myself getting a very nice steady breath with the heart rate yeah and it's well. through in and through it's in through the nose out through the out the nose um i actually never liked where they teach you in gym class you know when you're doing the mile run to inhale in your nose and exhale out your mouth it actually tired me out all the time doing that i find that when i'm doing my yoga practice or even doing bar because i do both um I, I get a nice, st it, it, but it, it's matching my heart rate. Yeah. And we can talk more about the in in intricacies of the nose because both the nostrils represent two different energies. So the left is the feminine, the right is the masculine. That's why the left side of the nostril gets pierced in India. I got mine pierced in India. It was, they did it on the wrong side with me in America. This is Ayurvedic. Um, I, I didn't have, I don't have it now, but when I do get it re-pierced, I'll have side. to go on the other side. <laughs> I actually have pictures. I'll see if I can find them and put up on this video pictures of me getting my nose pierced in India. Doctor didn't even have gloves on, just stuck that needle right on through. And there was a baby that had just been born that was literally right by my feet. <laughs> um, but that's oh it. Oh my God. And he sang the Beatles to me as he was doing it. Um, but anyway, um, I did it at the hospital. He was the same doctor that worked with me when I had my kidney infection and when I got my bacteria infection years later. But um, but yeah, we can talk about that as well, that how the nostril works. One side is going to be stronger in one hour. One side is going to be strong on the other hour. We can You can do alternate nostril breathing um, and how that affects. And like if the right side's clogged, you can pump into your left armpit and it'll release the right. Um, there's all these different things you can do, but don't worry about that in the beginning. Remember, you're a beginner for the first 10 years. Be happy being a beginner. That's the, at the beginning, there's so many possibilities, right? And at the end, there's not many possibilities. You know, you go into a practice and you, you think, oh, I'm going to hate this. And then you actually hate it in the middle of it. And you hate it and you hate it. And then at the end of it, you're like, holy shit, I just did that. And then you actually start to take a love for it. Not that you're like, oh, I can't wait to do my practice and get on that mat. Like it's still, it's still, um, you still have to get yourself, you still have to light the fire under your ass to do it. Right. But there is such a liberation when you actually do it. And um, I actually, I, I really love the Ashtanga yoga practice for what, you know, 
I, so far. I, I do. Now, that doesn't mean I, I like it in the middle of practicing. There's some oh. parts of it. Like, I'll be S on salutations at the beginning of it. I'm already thinking of my, one of the last poses, you know, uh, the uh, Navasana, because uh, that's the one I struggle with the most. And uh, or the the stupid one of not stupid. It's not stupid at all. But standing on my on one foot and lifting the other foot and balancing Utira and catching has to, the Utira has to put into a And the and the reason is well, number one, I I'm not that flexible yet where I can actually hold my leg up straight. But I'll get there, and I I'm getting there. It it's it takes a long it, you have to practice it that's why they call it practice right because practice you're never performing well let's talk about that for that's the first posture of primary series utita hasta pot and gustasana that's the first posture of primary it's, series. The, it's the foot it the foot starts to cramp up well, well when you're so when you're taking that foot so what people do you have to be able to, to so most people in the beginning have they have their legs bent they can't that's me so when you when, when you're finally straight so you, you eventually learn how to just catch the toe and then you point the toe and pull against it. So what's that doing when you're pointing the toe and pulling against it? That's engaging the inner thigh up into the perineum, which is molabunda. And then you can pull your chin to your shin and fold while you're standing on the, on the left leg, right? And then when you pull the leg to the side, you're continuing to point that toe because it's still activating. And when your head looks the other way, you're keeping your eyes up because that's the top of Shashumna. That's the top of that Kundalini, right? And then when you come back, fold again, inhale up, and then you have your hands on your on your waist as you're holding that leg up. What are you doing in this situation? This is Navasana, but in a different posture. And Utida has to have to I hate that. <laughs> but what people tend to do, this is why you need a teacher, because what people tend to do is if they're not strong, the ego, the ego catches in and goes, Oh, I need to get my leg really high. But their core is not strong enough. But the ego mm -hmm. is telling them to lift the leg higher. So they start to rock back, backwards. Mm -hmm. Instead of my issue straight. is my foot starts to cramp up, up, but it's the same thing with my wrist. My ramp, my wrists were cramping up. I mean, the beginning of it all, but then I built up the strength, and now I can hold. I can hold the beef up, okay. And I and and now my wrist, my wrists hurt once in a while, but nothing like they used to. Listen, I couldn't even do an arm wrestle without my wrist feeling like they were broken. That's how badly they hurt. They hurt so badly, and I tried with all my might to avoid doing any kind of posture with anything bar yoga that that was lifting my body up with my wrists which was it the was, last thing you should have been doing it was scary for me because my wrists literally felt broken and I, i'm i'm bringing this up because i know this is a very common thing it's very common yeah but i worked and i i sweated out i i worked at it and i worked at it and i worked at it and it actually, when Bryce, you were here, was I? That's when I really had my breakthrough with it, mm -hmm. because Bryce did push me instead of me. Because when we're just by ourselves, we no, I, I don't need to do this today. You know, I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do it another day. I'll, and then you avoid, and and but then you don't have the breakthrough. So mm -hmm. it's like that's that's where it's amazing having a teacher because then they push you, push you, push you. And if they, if they don't think you can make that, you know, it, they're going to push you to where they feel yeah. you're going you're to go. Okay? You're not gonna, you, the teacher's not going to take you on your first day and wrap your legs around your head. No, you're not going to open Pandora's box. You're going to build up to that. It, that's why it takes 10 years, guys. It takes 10 years to make it through primary series. Yeah. You're not, I mean, I, actually we were on the phone the other day and Stephanie, you said, I think I've almost been able, I'm almost able to lift up, jump back. And I stopped you and I said, okay, we need to revisit this because this should take you about seven years to work through so something's in my head as a teacher that told me you might be cheating it and you don't even know it and you're that's going to lead to injury mm -hmm. that's what told that's what informed me because i know how long that takes to do that to be able to lift up and pull the core up to the point where your butt pops up and you're on your hands and then you drop jump back that's like a mini handstand coming up like that so i know i know intuitively how long that takes to learn you know that takes years um, so, um, so yes, I know Emmy's gotta, gotta, gotta leave, but, um, so we'll, we'll get back to that. And, um, and that's, and I told you, I was like, and Emmy, I told you, I want to work with you girls off camera with some work and, and doing that to work with you both on really working with that, to get that jump back started that starting. So I bought blocks, I bought blocks so that I could do, um, yeah. push ups on them to strengthen my shoulders. Cause 
when it's that protraction and the foot mm -hmm. too, again, you're feeling cramps in your foot because you had your foot and shoes all these years. So now the foot's starting to mm -hmm. stretch back out again. That's what you're feeling. You're just feeling it come to life. Don't yeah. run from pain. If you're running from pain, you're going to have to do this life over again. That's just the hard truth reality. If you're running from pain, you're going to have to do this life over again. That's just how it is. So why not just sink your teeth into it? The pain is yeah. interesting. That's where it's interesting, right? All right, ladies, I know you got to go. We'll get to psychedelics next week. We got a lot of stuff to talk about, but I hope that answered some questions. Email me if you have any more questions. Don't let yourself, don't be, you are always your biggest limitation. It's not your diseases. It's not your injuries. It's you. That's what the yoga sutras say. You are your own worst enemy. Basically, that's what he's saying. Guess what, boo? All your problems, you're it. <laughs> Now let's work. And what an empowering yeah. place to be, right? You're not the victim anymore. Yep. Yes. So empowering. So empowering, right? So, all right, ladies, that was a long episode. I hope I, I, I hope that helps people. We'll keep going. We'll keep talking about this. I'm going to see if I can get Marty, touch with Marnie Alton. I'll see if I can find other yoga people to come on as well and talk about this so we can get all these different. Because sometimes I could say the same thing over and over and again. But if someone else says it in a different way, someone hears it differently. So anyway. All right, guys, find a teacher, find a teacher. If you don't have the money, just talk to them. They can work with you. If you got to travel in, that's normal. They can zoom with you. First step, find a teacher. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.